Thanks for uh, having me. It's a pleasure to be here at the first CV Innovation Summit. Uh, really happy that uh, we have a meeting that's an hour away from Phoenix that I can fly to, and I hope to come here every year from here on in. So uh, the case uh, that I've been asked to talk about was my worst coronary complication in 2017. And uh, hopefully this is going to be a very interactive discussion. I see that the room is packed, and hopefully feel free to interject at any time, ask questions, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay? So uh, trying to click the slide. Yeah. So the clinical vignette of this case is as follows. This was an 83-year-old male uh, that was referred to me from um, uh, one of the uh, – uh, outlying hospitals in Arizona. The patient had mild dementia, was, uh, had a CT at the other facility, and was found to have a porcelain aorta. He had a high syntax score, but was obviously turned down for cabbage. He was then referred to me for multivessel PCI. His EF was normal, and uh, I mean, his uh, renal function was normal, and his EF was slightly low, and he had mild to moderate MR. So <clears throat> here are his diagnostic angiograms on the left. Uh, you can pretty much see he's got a subtotal left main, which is heavily calcified. He's got an occluded LED uh, that you don't really appreciate uh, in this view, uh, which is the AP collar projection. And then you see he's got a, uh, a complex calcified right coronary stenosis. <clears throat> so before we even get started, you know, I think just to know, we've sort of become the last stop for surgeons now because a lot of the times surgeons say no to cases and then the patients ultimately come back to us. And it's kind of been a role reversal over the last 10 years where we used to send cases to surgery and then and now it's the other way around. And so this is not, a, not an unusual situation at a center like ours, which is a chip center of excellence. So we get cases like these all the time. And a lot of the times the cases get referred by our surgeons. As it turns out, the RCA wasn't really... Uh, super challenging, but uh, needed debulking, and uh, with some guide extension support, we were able to uh, treat it successfully, as shown here, uh, with a couple of long drug eluding stents with a nice result. So Dharam says I can't, he can't hear me. I think that's because the ambient noise from the outside. I don't know if I should speak a little louder, but I don't want to like make the people that are close to me go deaf, because that will be the other problem if I speak too loud. So. Oh, so you think I should speak loud? Okay, I'm sorry. I'll speak loudly. So. Let's pull the doors shut, and maybe people spray it if we can. There's any way. Yeah, there's this room here, and I hopefully the, the imaging is, is pretty clear. So I wouldn't clutter around the door. Erica, you can move there, I think, to the left. I'll pick on you since I know you. <laughs> And hopefully people will follow you there. So. All right, sounds good. So, uh, so the RCA was, was challenging but wasn't too hard. We were able to get it done and then sort of moved on to, uh, to, to the left system, which clearly was the more, more difficult of the two. Any questions thus far about uh, – obviously you see an impella, you obviously see a pacer, and um, – and you obviously see dual injections, see the LED uh, filling retrograde from the right coronary. I, I think it depends on which view. So these are, this isn't an RAO view. This is a typical AP cranial and an odd view and an LAO view for the left side. So you really can't tell the location of the impella. Uh, but uh, usually go by the signal that you see, and you see the current seemed okay. So. Yeah, it does look like it's getting sucked in, probably related to maybe an underfilled LV. That's a good point to notice, yeah. So what's your strategy? So what is our strategy? The good question. So I'll ask you that. What is your strategy? My strategy was uh, to uh, do what we call an anti-grade wire escalation strategy with a penetration wire, and then as a bailout switch to uh, an anti-grade dissection reentry strategy having uh, no real diagonal arteries to worry about, no real major branches except a few other septals in the mid portion of the LED that we're filling from the right anyway, uh, that we were potentially risk sharing if we re-entered distal to them. But I didn't think there were major branches to be concerned about. Tony or uh, Min or anybody else that are CTO experts in the audience, uh, would you kind of agree with that sort of plan or Jay or anybody else? 
No, I think that that's sound. You don't want to um, jeopardize large branches, but you demonstrate there isn't a huge diagonal that's in jeopardy, so that's a great bailout strategy in this situation. Yeah. Uh, Min, do you have any? Well, he's, he's somewhere. He left the room. He's gone. So yeah. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Bukhari. Uh, yes, instead of, but I had ballooned the left main to get everything through because even just, yeah. Well, that's an option, but the question was how would you tackle the circ first? Like, would you put a stent across the left main? The point is that ultimately, no matter what I did definitively to treat the circ, I would have to treat right back to the ostium of the LA left main. In which case, I would then have to go after an LAD CTO through a stent stride of a freshly deployed stent in the left main, which is not a good plan. So I ballooned the left main into the two wires that I have. So I have a wire in the circ, I have a wire in that ramus that you can see, which are the other two wires, to allow me access into the LAD. And once I had access into the LAD with the microcatheter and flow in both those vessels were preserved, I felt like I could go with the primary strategy of ultimately taking care of the LAD with the stent and then rescuing the circumflex and ramus and treat those provisionally or if you had to with a two or three stent strategy. What, uh, what access do you have? Because you actually have an antenna. So you have radial and two panels? Right, no. So you can see all the tubes are from the groin. So there's nothing coming from the wrist. You see there are three catheters coming from the groin. So it's not unusual if patients that have had like a, 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 a previous CT or a workup, like in this case he had a CT for his porcelain aorta, we frequently will ask them to do a quick shot down up to the legs. So if his arteries are like five and six millimeters, you can easily put an impella and a six French or an eight and a six in the same groin on one side. So in situations like that, uh, since I'm not a big radial operator, uh, I hadn't you know, adopted to doing it for these type of complex cases then. Uh, I just would basically use an eight French for an anti-grade. And I thought for that right coronary, a six French guide, which you can see is a little smaller than the eight French that you see on the left, you could go with a 1.5 burr or even a 1.75 burr through one of these larger lumen Medtronic or Boston Scientific uh, uh, six French guides that you can do a rotoblader through a 1.75 burr. So I have a six guide through either the right or the left femoral, I can't remember. Uh, and then on that same side, I have an eight French guide for the anti-grade left. And on the contralateral side, I have the impeller. So you can use two guys. You can use two sheets in the same guard. All right. Any other questions? All right. So keep going. So this is what happened. Sorry, I jumped that. So. Yeah. So that's the that's here on the left side. Somebody touched it. Who touched it? Any AV help? She's on her way. She's coming. Here she comes. Could even be the plug in. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry for the guys on the 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 right of me. I. I guess we'll have to, I'll just keep rolling in the interest of time. So we were able to uh, get a penetration wire down into the LAD, like I showed here. And uh, at that point, we were pretty much high-fiving and thinking we were done. Because, I mean, you have a wire across, and you have a microcatheter, and I have a whole host of microcatheters in my cath lab. So I figured that uh, one of them would be able to go, and we should be able to uh, take care of it from there. But unfortunately... This is what happened. Nothing else would pass. So here are my 10 solutions, which I think everybody should have in their back, back, back pocket for dealing with a situation where a wire goes in, into the artery, and nothing else will follow. So here's one. Step one. It's from simplicity to more complex. Increase your support. So obviously, if you're using a six guide, using an eight guide would help. If you're using a EBU, using an amplites might help. Using a guide extension would help. So those are step one, simple things. Second two, sec is use a small balloon. Uh, don't use an 8 or a 12 millimeter balloon because the marker within a 20 millimeter balloon is the largest profile portion of that balloon. So the more you can wedge into where you need to go, you'll be able to get 10 millimeters, for example, of the 
balloon into where you need to be. If you use an 8 or a 10 millimeter balloon, you would only get 4 or 5 millimeters into the lesion. So I typically will default to a 125 or a 1520. And, and then you could do what's called BAM, which is balloon-assisted microdissection with that same balloon, which is intentionally rupturing that balloon. Then you could switch, if that doesn't work, we could try switching to a stiffer microcatheter. A turnpike gold would be option four. Option five, if you're lucky in your lab, has set up a, a, an atherectomy a device available for use, which is what we do. We switch, would then try to do a um, spectra, an, an old, uh, 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 turbo elite laser run to try to uh, get catheters uh, across. Uh, then you could do what's called a Carlino, which if people that don't know, this is a modification of the proximal cap in CTOs with contrast. So you take a microcatheter or a 3cc syringe and inject, uh, with a, inject some contrast to see if you could soften the cap up. Or you could try using some fancy newer microcatheters like a micro 14 and then try to see if you could deliver a rotowire and then perform a rotational atherectomy directly if you can somehow get past where you are, or go retrograde, or go to plan B, which is the impenetrable cap algorithm, in which case you would then do what's called some other things, crazier things, like scratch and go, laser on contrast, a modified base power knuckle, or Carlino. So here's what we ended up doing. So the wire crossed and nothing else would go. I went through all those six things that I showed you on the slide prior to that, and none of them worked. So then we did what's called scratch and go. So scratch and go is a technique where you would basically get around the segment that's creating your problem and using a penetration wire like a Pro 12, in which case this is what we did, and then follow that with a hydrophilic polymer jacketed wire like a Pilot 200, which is what we did here. And the knuckled polymer jacketed wire is now in the subminimal space surrounding the cap that was creating all the problem. And that's very well illustrated in the left uh, image. Then in the right image, we use that and balloon that subminimal space with a 2-0 balloon, which is what I did here, over that knuckled wire. So you have now bypassed that segment within the artery that was resistant to allowing any gear to go. So then we ended up going down, and we were able to do ADR, which is demonstrated here with the Stingray in the mid-LAD. And uh, the ADR was facilitated... Uh, uh, with the balloon that we had passed because the Stingray LP, even though is a better balloon than the original Stingray, still requires at least a 1.5 uh, balloon or sometimes even a 2.0 balloon in a calcified segment. So as you can see in the right panel, we were able to successfully do a stick and swap. Actually, it wasn't even a stick and swap. It was a, sti a, a stick and go. We were able to use the Stingray wire and get it down into the LED, as you can see in that right panel, going from the subminimal space into the true lumen captured on that fluorosave, as you can see the wire run through. So then we did the PCI of the LED, and you can see there that the LED is all roughed up from the side that was uh, dissected. And on the right panel, we did an angioplasty, and on the right panel, you see that. So now that is the mother of all perforations. <laughs> I don't think... Uh, People, you've seen perforations, but you haven't seen filling of the entire pericardium with one injection. <laughs> and that is the entire pericardial space filling up. And you can actually see beautifully the silhouette of the heart suddenly getting a lot bigger with the contrast filling of the pericardial space. Ashish, uh, the wire that you initiated, the penetrating wire that you used, what, what was, a Pro 12. was a Pro 12. Yeah, but that was in the lumen all along. It was, okay. Yeah. So, of course, hemodynamic collapse right away. I mean, as expected. So CPR right away. And so uh, in the midst of CPR, again, thankfully, the impeller was in. And so that really helped uh, to stabilize uh, the situation a little bit sooner and allow us to regroup, blow up a balloon, uh, and then get our Joe stent in place. And then uh, we were able to deploy uh, a couple of graft masters. And a good trick is to use, if one doesn't work, put one inside the other. And an even better trick is to put a DES first and then deploy the graft masters so that the idea being that you still have some drug-eluting um, uh, platform that's in contact with the uh, initial perf, and hopefully you're going to have less uh, chance of... Uh, 
of these closing, mm -hmm. which is we've been a problem with these drug eluding, with these graft masters. So we were able to uh, do a pericardiosynthesis uh, at the same time, as you can now see a pigtail catheter in the pericardium on the left. And after the deployment of those two uh, uh, graft masters and a stent in the mid LED, we were able to uh, take care of it. At this point, I was in no mood to chase the bifurcation of the left main. I was happy that the patient was alive, and we were happy we were out of dodge. And so we called it a day without worrying about uh, as long as there was flow in that circ. The guy had a three-day hospital stay. We took the impella out the next morning. The repeat echo showed some mild effusion without tamponade. Of course, the contrast load and hypotension during the case, he developed some AKI. He also was a little confused because of uh, the uh, probable ischemic insult from uh, inadequate cerebral perfusion from CPR. But all that resolved on day three. He was discharged to a sniff. And uh, actually, at six-month follow-up, he's doing pretty well. This procedure was done in January of this year. That's great. That's good. That's it. Did, Thank uh, you for your did time. You, uh, which, did you use a guideline? Did you use a guideline? No guideline? I think after that subinterval space that we had created, uh, getting stuff, you getting the graph master in, wow. the three five graph masters just flew right in. Great. Dr. Prashad, uh, with that sizable uh, perforation, did you consider uh, terminating your anticoagulation? Or? Never. Never. The answer is N-E-V-E-R. Never. Do not do that. The last time you're going to, the, you're going to get into trouble for two way, in two ways when you try to uh, stop the anticoagulation. The initial reflux is to, to protamine the patient. Uh, we use heparin for all our CTOs, so the patient was on heparin. Angiomax is a whole different story, but I would never uh, anticoagulate, uh, reverse the anticoagulation because not only are you going to have the risk of your uh, graft master occluding, but you're also going to develop clots in the pericardium. And if you get developed clots in the pericardium, then your 6 French or 7 French pigtail is no longer going to be able to drain the pericardium. And then you're stuck because then you are left with needing to do a sub xiphoid window and call the surgeon, which makes it even more challenging in a tough situation. So uh, nothing ever uh, is lost by keeping the anticoagulation going as long as you have control over, over the bleed. Just taking a couple steps back, uh, Dean Madoulis from Ohio State. Um, just your thought process from the beginning. Uh, one of the audience members brought up a good point. You fixed the right good collaterals to the LAD, 80-year-old. Was there a thought of just to revascularize the lateral circulation to the CERC and leave the LAD? Even if I revascularize the uh, circulation to the CERC, I would still need to treat the whole left main system. That's right. And so you're LAD, saying leave though. the I, 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 You know what? Uh, I respectfully would disagree because uh, we are a strong believer in uh, complete revascularization, leaving a patient with a uh, ischemic entire anterior wall, which probably would imply 20 to 25 percent of his myocardium. Well, I think got, would probably not be. In yeah. hindsight, when you have a complication, you can always look back and say maybe should have, would have. But I don't think that uh, in uh, doing it again, yeah. we would contemplate leaving the LED alone. Well, he's 80. You no, know. but at the same time, would you send an 80-year-old for a cabbage and not have him do a lima and just do a vein to well, the ramus? Well, you don't for a cabbage, but we have plenty of patients we know in clinic we follow who have robust collaterals that are doing just quite well 10 years, 15 years out without a decrease in the EF. So just it, a thought. It's always hindsight's 20, 20. Yeah, I, I, but I, I think that, I think that uh, we uh, uh, respectfully would disagree, and I think uh, we believe, like I said, in complex revascularization, complete revascularization. And if this guy's anterior wall was ischemic, uh, and we would try to get what the surgeons would get for him, and the surgeons would get a lemur to the LAD, a vein to the OM, and a vein to the right. And that's what we wanted to achieve. I'd also argue that that LAD didn't look like it would be that, that complex. The CTO of the, the LAD. Of the LAD. Like your, the left main looks more heavily calcified. Like it's not, like you wouldn't have expected to have that much difficulty before yeah. going yeah. into the procedure. So yeah. you, you know, a CTO is a CTO. No real case is a simple CTO. So we respect even a short segment CTO that we potentially could do in 10 minutes, but we've learned to respect that over the years. So I respectfully uh, disagree, but I can see your point.